Hello and welcome to another event on the Spectators Alternative Conference. Um, we today are going to be looking at a topic that Kate Andrews wrote about back, I think we've now left the summer, so back in the summer. And at the time she posed the question about magic money. Now, when she wrote this, the figures were pretty stark. We had, we're looking at a deficit of 300 billion, uh, made possible by 200 billion of quantitative easing. And at the time, one senior Tory MP, as she quoted in her cover piece, said, we fought the last election saying there was no money tree. Now we say there is one, and it's in the garden of the Bank of England. Since then, the sums have got even more vast. Uh, we had the chance to announce more measures in his winter economic package. However, Rishi Sunak has indicated that one day he may have to balance the books, something no one in the country has done for quite a while now. So to discuss how the current situation looks, how long it can last, and whether the Tories are on course for a nasty surprise, I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of Kate Andrews, the author herself, uh, Liam Harrigan, who writes for the Telegraph on economics, and also the Spectator, and our editor Fraser Nelson. Um, Kate, we'll go to you first. Uh, can you just give us an update on how the magic money tree is looking? Is it in full bloom? So it's still growing. Uh, as you said, Katie, when the cover piece was written over the summer, we had two hundred billion pounds worth of quantitative easing being pumped. Now that's gone up to 300 billion since then we've had an extra 100 billion and also estimates to how uh, big the UK's deficit will be this year have also increased. Uh, I think the official ones from uh, the OBR are now almost at 400 billion, uh, while some independent estimates have put it over 400 billion. Now, we have been told all year that this is a one-off spending spree, that you should think of it as wartime spending, that this is not normal behavior, that we're not going to create a structural deficit that is increasing day-to-day -day spending that you then have to tackle down the road. I think the problem we have here is, well, it's twofold. When, when the piece was written back in the summer, it seemed as if the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, was going to be extremely cautious about out not mixing up COVID emergency spending and day-to-day -day spending. Um, reports that he was making very clear, in fact, he made clear on Sajid Javid's podcast that he was happy to fund the Treasury to the point of helping with coronavirus, but he wasn't going to be subsidizing railways, he wasn't going to be contributing to the green agenda, that that was something that government had to decide and raise revenue accordingly. But last week we saw the governor make another intervention and it was to the tune of rethinking the furlough scheme, specifically the furlough scheme coming to, the, to an end. And then almost immediately we had the chancellor updating us with the job support package. Now that costs a lot less money or is estimated to cost a lot less money than the furlough scheme did. But I think it was an indication that perhaps the bank of England is going to be quite happy to continue to directly finance the Treasury for these COVID schemes well past 2020. And, and that raises questions about whether or not this is a one-off spend or if we are starting to create a structural deficit. And uh, that's, a, that's a very different uh, ball game, really, because it puts the UK on much shakier financial ground. Now, in this discussion, we will be taking questions. So if you do have any questions, write them into the Zoom chat function and we'll try and get in as many as possible. Uh, particularly if you want to uh, come out in defense of the magic money tree, we're ready to hear that. Um, Liam, when we're looking at quantitative easing, something you often hear from Tory MPs these days is actually we should all chill out about borrowing their historically low rates. And you know we might have talked about a long-term economic plan a while ago, but this is quite out of vogue because the circumstances have changed and so have we. So do they have a point? Um, yeah, it's different this time. Uh, the most dangerous words in the English language. Uh, everybody wants to believe it's different this time, but of course it isn't. Let's just consider where we are, Katie. So the FTSE 100 is 20% up since uh, lockdown in March. That's bull market territory. And even though the UK government has borrowed £175 billion pounds so far this year and is heading for a 20% of GDP budget deficit, borrowing costs are actually down. Have the laws of economics been suspended? No, they haven't. The reason stock markets are so dangerously bloated, bond markets are so dangerously bloated with bond prices high, which makes yields low, is because, of course, quantitative easing. Now, back in 2009, the global banking system was on the brink of collapse. There was a justification for emergency monetary measures. Um, 
but that post-crisis uh, necessity, it should have been used as a crash pad to sort of restructure our banking system. Instead, it became a, a comfort blanket. So the kind of uh, emergency measure has become medicine, has become like a sort of lifestyle choice. Back in, in 2009, our QE program was billed as a 50 billion pound uh, program, uh, egged on by city financiers who wanted share prices to keep going like the clappers, egged on by governments who wanted to keep borrowing money as much as they wanted to uh, and keep bond prices low with the Bank of England buying bonds. QE, rather than 50 billion, it went to 450 billion by the end of 2019. So that's an nine times bigger than it was uh, billed as. And it's not just the UK, of course. The Fed is doing this. The Bank of Japan is doing this. The ECB is doing this. But since March, our 450 billion quid of quantitative easing has become 745 billion quid of quantitative easing. And we're, the government, uh, the Bank of England is buying bonds now at twice the rate that it was during the financial crisis. Now, as you say, much of our media class, our political class has convinced themselves that this will all be fine. You, know, you get Westminster sages who never really taken any notice of bond markets saying, oh, debt service costs are low. It will all be fine. But it will, you know, in the end, the markets will decide what the rate of interest is, whatever the Bank of England says and does. And that's one of the cardinal lessons of history. And I'd say, and I've written in The Spectator in the past, that I think quantitative easing now is well past the point where it's actually counterproductive. Financial markets have lost their ability to correct because of this. So they're taking bigger and bigger risks. Central bank bond buying means far too much money is locked up in zombie co companies uh, that wouldn't survive without quantitative easing. And that means we're getting low productivity. This distorts basic economics. If you don't get a return on your savings and you're paid to borrow, we're very much through the looking glass. And people often accuse uh, me of overstating this. Where's that inflation you spoke about? They say to me, uh, and I suspect that will come up in this um, uh, meeting too. And what I say is, look, we have seen enormous inflation in stock prices, in bond prices, in property prices, but a lot of the QE money has stayed inside the banking system. The, the commercial banks have given it back to the central banks as, uh, as reserves. So the commercial banks that were insolvent look solvent, even though they've relied on quantitative easing. And what I'd say is we're building up huge debts because of quantitative easing that will come back to uh, uh, haunt us. And as the final thing, you know, we've got interviews now, soft soap interviews from uh, Bank of England, Monetary Policy Committee members saying, oh, it'd be fine if we, if we yank interest rates into nominal negative territory. Interest rates, of course, have been in real terms negative territory for a long time into nominal negative territory. Look, Outside of the city of London, outside of the financiers, real world investors, they're not not investing because interest rates are too high. Uh, uh, taking interest rates negative aren't going to make people build more factories and employ more people out there in the real world in the 90% of the economy that isn't financial services. In fact, this kind of extreme monetary policy is really spooking most run of the mill business owners and business leaders. And I think if we go to negative interest rates, which will be solely to placate financial markets, solely so everyone can keep dancing, then that will mean that the real world investors leave even more money on the table. We should be implementing a monetary retreat. We should be trying to cool financial markets rather than keep stoking them up. And the prerequisite of that is having the debate, the argument that we're having today in saying that even though everybody's got a vested interest in wanting this thing to continue, in the end, it has to end. Fraser, uh, Liam mentions that many are quick to say, well, we haven't seen that change in inflation. And um, can you see any positives in the current magic money situation? Yeah, you bet. And um, it's a little, like 10 years ago, I would have been lining up with Liam. Absolutely. I made the same predictions as he did about quantitative easing. Basically, look, saying you can't get money for nothing. It will all end in tears. Well, you know what? It didn't end in tears. I made predictions about how inflation would be um, at some point or another, rising away. Instead, we've seen hardly any inflation. And it has led me to begin to do something I don't very often do, which is to change my mind. 
Um, I'm not now saying that I'm now basically going to advocate the government keeps um, spending like a drunken Keynesians um, all day around. Um, I instinctively feel that something is going wrong when the government's solution to every problem is to spend and borrow money. But I find it harder now to argue with those who say to me, look, you guys said 10 years ago that QE would lend to disaster. It didn't. You've been saying for 10 years that interest rates are going to go back to normal. They haven't. Um, in fact, the whole of austerity was based on this assumption that if governments didn't balance their books, then the bond markets would come back and punish us. In other words, if governments didn't manage to um, get their deficits under control, the cost of borrowing would be really high. It would be like 5%, 7%. And we would be punished in a way that Italy was being punished 10 years ago. But let's just have a look at what's happened recently. So I think we can all agree that in the last 10 years, um, the British government has not particularly behaved itself when it came to debt. We entered the last decade with debt of about one trillion pounds. Now we're at debt of about two trillion pounds. We had national, doubled our national debt over that period. Then we hit a genuine crisis in the coronavirus. We see economies collapse. We see the biggest contraction in economic growth that any of us will ever live through. We've seen um, landlords unable to collect rent. We've seen shops unable to collect custom. We've seen a massive shock to the financial system. And what happened? Were they living on the edge? Did they collapse? No. They all, the banking system managed to get through this pretty well because they had been stress tested. Ever since the last tech crash, the regulators would come in and they were saying, okay, let's see, make sure you guys have got enough capital. So if there is a recession, if these following th bad things do happen, that you're ready to withstand the shock. Well, all of those stress tests seem to have worked. We haven't seen any failed banks, and we've seen the most incredible financial upheaval that anybody can remember. We've also seen the British government borrow, I think, something like 130 billion extra pounds in borrowing. And it seems the markets are quite happy to do that. Right now, the rate of interest is 0.2%. In zero, is 0 now, I know what um, Liam and Kate will be itching to say. Yes, the interest rates are only so low because... The, um, the Bank of England is printing money right now. It's artificially depressing the gilt markets. These aren't real market rates. You wait to see what happens when they stop printing money. And yes, I accept all those arguments. They could well be true. I'm just saying that right now, the thing that hasn't happened is the financial domino has not fallen over. A decade worth of debt and pretty high spending has not rebounded in Britain right now. So you have to ask, has something changed? Now, I'll tell you what has been niggling away at my mind, and I'd be interested to know um, how, how Liam and Kate um, explain this. You can look at the, um, the interest rates, not just for the last few years, we all know it's been crazy these last few years, but we look at back over decades, you can see a steady decline in global interest rates heading towards zero. Now they're going beneath zero. We're getting negative real interest rates, we're being paid to borrow, and yes, it sounds crazy, but it's not so crazy that it has led to economies toppling over. So might it just be that we're in a new monetary era, that there is such a thing as new monetary theory, that it could be written off by conservatives as the magic money tree, but right now there's a glut of Asian savings, there's a huge amount of money looking for a home, and we're living through a period where simply the safekeeping of money, the knowledge that you'll return the money that you're lent, is enough for you to actually be paid to keep that money. It sounds crazy, but it's not happening in enough countries for it to be true. So this is why I think there's been a fundamental change in the monetary weather. Now things might, I, I know I can also hear Liam thinking, ah, Fraser, you're saying this time is different. This is the refrain that we've heard throughout history before every single time things go pop. Now that's right, but we also ought to keep our minds open, I think, to the idea that this time it really is different. And there's something here that the classic economists, that the, um, the, the bond vigilantes haven't quite worked out. And perhaps Boris Johnson's onto something when he actually says that, yes, you can borrow because the markets do want to lend. And with interest rates so low, it would be frankly rude not to. Now, I'm going to go to the other panelists for their response to that, um, Fraser, but just quickly first. So you're in Rishi Sunak's shoes and you're looking ahead. Do you think that responsibly he can shake that money tree for a little bit longer? Oh, you bet. I mean, there's, I wouldn't be surprised 
because the Bank of England does another 100 billion of money printing. He can keep sh shaking it, it can keep producing this fruit. The question is whether it will all turn to ashes at some point. Um, and if I were Rishi Sunak, I would be thinking to myself, look, you simply cannot run an economy on the gamble, and it is a very big gamble, that we're in this new monetary era, what Sajid Javid, his predecessor, called the low for long era. Um, because we don't, the thing is, the conventional economics does not explain the monetary situation that we find in, ourselves in right now. The old textbooks would tell you, as Liam and Kate will tell you, that the, we ought to be paid a big financial price for this. Now, the old laws of gravity might reassert themselves at any point. So if I were Rishi Sunak, I would absolutely be trying to get as reconcile taxes and spending to a level where they ought to be right now. But I can see why Rishi Sunak, why Sajid Javid, why even Chancellor um, Liam Halligan would struggle to win this argument against the number 10 that would basically say, look, you guys have been saying this for 10 years, it hasn't happened, the market's willing to lend us money, so let's just keep doing it because right now we need to build these roads. And Sasha Javid, by the way, he's no, um, he, he's no lefty economist, he's a former financier, and he was saying, look, on a basic financial um, uh, prognosis here, if you can borrow money at 0.1% in a project that will give you a 2% return, then you do it. You cover your costs, you do it. And for as long as people are willing to lend money to the government at this low levels, it makes economic sense to invest that money in projects that will deliver a positive return on that borrowing. Kate, let's go to you first. What do you say in response to Fraser? Are the laws of gravity changing on this? Gosh, a lot. Um, I have a lot to say, but uh, I, I guess- We have time. To to come back very quickly on the point that Fraser just raised about uh, the former chancellor. Um, it's one thing to say, look, we can borrow this money so we can spend this money and let's invest it. Uh, I think the follow up to that would always be, is it a good investment? You're still using resources and are they best spent in, in the public sector as opposed to the private sector? Is it really the case that this is going to create the money, create the jobs that you think it is? Very often government is bad at picking these projects. So just because you can spend money in a moment doesn't necessarily mean that you should. But to the broader point that Fraser raised, are we just in this new monetary era? I mean, possibly. I wouldn't rule anything out these days. It's, it's impossible to say really where we're going and whether or not the UK government and indeed governments around the world will be punished for printing this money and borrowing at such high rates. But people often point to Japan to say, look, you can do QE successfully. It's fine to have negative interest rates, but you can't just compare these countries' monetary policies without looking with what's happening on, on beneath the surface, I should say. Um, Japan is thought to be a real exception here in that actually the savings and the money is in the Japanese economy that private individuals save so much more compared to here in the UK, that if somebody ever said, you know what, we're going to we're going to build them. We need to find this money that it actually is there in the Japanese economy in the way that it really isn't in the UK. Uh, I think another issue you have is that it may well be that the UK isn't punished this time. But as I said in the beginning, our financial situation is becoming increasingly shaky. The Office for Budget Responsibility estimated that without coronavirus in the next 50 years, the UK's debt to GDP ratio would be a staggering 275%. That's without a pandemic, without emergency spending. For decades now, the UK government has been spending money it doesn't have. It's been making promises around pensions and healthcare uh, and, and, and many other giveaways in society that it really can't afford. And I think that COVID-19 may not be the breaking point. Um, I don't know what the breaking point will be. I don't think anybody on this panel could possibly say. But one of the major issues and what I'm really nervous about isn't that printing money to help tackle COVID-19 is the problem, but the fact that we were on such shaky ground to begin with. At some point, there's going to be nowhere else to go. And it might not be this pandemic. We might just about get through. But I think it's notable uh, that our debt finance spending is higher than it is in Italy or Greece or Spain. Britain's having to borrow more than almost any other developed country. So all the Western countries may look quite ugly at the end of this. But if Britain looks ugliest, uh, that's going to be uh, quite a serious problem, uh, not, not, not just in, in the short term, but in the medium and long term for paying off this debt eventually. You need to inspire confidence. You need to be the country where people want to invest. And Britain at the moment isn't looking as good as it could.
Liam, what do you say to that and what Fraser was talking about? I mean, as he says, we've been expecting and sort of told this might be coming for some time. So is it enough to just say, just wait a bit longer and then I'll be right? <laughs> um, I mean, what I'd say about inflation since 2009 is that we have had inflation. We've had really big inflation in asset markets, in bond prices, in stock prices, in property prices. It's almost as if the, the way we measure inflation around the Western world for nerds who me like me who follow things like CPI baskets, it's almost as if the measurement has been deliberately altered in order to make sure that things prices are going up aren't actually included in the headline measures. We've also had since 2008-9 the kind of one-off impact of much much cheaper Chinese imports, chi uh, uh, imports from China, and Chinese exports now are much getting much more expensive, and that's a one-off uh, historic impact that helped us to keep inflation low that drops out of the numbers. Um, also, we should, re we should remember what happened with a lot of this quantitative easing money after the financial crisis. As I, as I explained briefly in my opening remarks, uh, the Bank of England bought bonds off market participants and those often investment banks and other uh, financial services companies, and they then returned the proceeds to the central bank in order to bolster their balance sheets as reserves. Um, and a lot of our bank restructuring wasn't actually when the banks issued more, more equity, uh, which is a more conventional way of banks uh, restructuring and facing the music. They literally used money that the Bank of England had given them that was created from nowhere. And that money is still held on reserve in the central bank. So for the students of economics, you've got like Friedman's V, the velocity of circulation has been on the floor for the last 10 years. And that's a big reason why we haven't had inflation uh, in a, measured in a conventional sense. But if the bank's banking system does start lending again, as the government wants it to, then that, in, that inflationary toothpaste will come out of the tube and you won't be able to get it back in. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, uh, make these arguments in a sort of political forum because they are quite technical arguments, but many people in financial markets understand them. And let's not, and let's not think that the austerity that we did practice uh, between 2010 and 2018 didn't help us to ride the financial waves, if you like. Yeah, Fraser's completely right that we went from like 800 billion of borrowing when Osborne came in, national debt, to over 2 trillion now. But we did show that the UK on a day-to-day, -day, on a year-to-year -year basis, could broadly live within its means. And and Kate, Kate Anderson is right. It is currency markets are an ugly contest. So we've got to make sure we're not the ugliest baby. And just because everyone else is doing something doesn't mean it's okay if you're doing it more than others. Now, the U, the way the UK economy is structured, let's get down to the brass tacks here. We are a, a globally oriented, service driven, gig economy uh, uh, country. Uh, with a huge emphasis on social interaction and cultural assets and all the rest of it. We, with, with London as the global hub, we have been hit by COVID much, much more than almost any other major economy in the world. And our borrowing is really a lot more uh, hyped up in the last three to four months than other economies in the world. So we are particularly vulnerable. We also have within our establishment, if you like, within politicians and people even at the Bank of England I talked to, over the years, yeah, they don't quite get that sterling isn't a reserve currency anymore. If you're, if you're America, you can just about kind of do this. That's the exorbitant privilege of being able to print hard currency, which wound de Gaulle up so much and is a big re motivation for the single currency, by the way, of the sort of monoists of the 60s and the 70s. But we are not a reserve currency and we have a stonking trade deficit. Uh, and no number of, Liz Trust is doing a good job, but no number of free trade agreements around the world is going to mean that our trade deficit suddenly disappears. And if we start getting, if our political class starts, you know, carries on with this kind of language that it's all fine, then currency markets are going to notice that. I mean, I read the Glasgow Herald often, Fraser will be pleased to know. And um, yeah, there's a, there's a senior politician from the SNP in there just this morning, a former aide to Alex Salmond. I mean, what he says is the state literally creates money. It does not need our money. The idea that the state needs to raise taxes, this guy said, 
in order to spend is simply not correct. I mean, that's we're going down this rabbit hole of, of intellectual uh, nonsensical statements. And we have to realize that, yeah, we've been getting away for this for a while during a period when we've been controlling our spending and being responsible. And the, the whole kind of thrust of the political debate is about bringing our spending under control. And our very broad and deep financial markets have been able to you know, understand and get their minds around a situation where the Bank of England owns a third of all outstanding government debt in this country, which it does. But what is unsustainable in the end will not be sustained. And that's an easy thing to say, but it's, it's a truth that it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to deny. You can't keep on doing this stuff. And of course, everyone will want to pretend you, you can, and any number of economists will line up and be paid to show you the graphs that prove you can do this. But it just doesn't pass the common sense sniff test. And in the end, financial fundamentals will prevail. However much politicians talk and however much central bankers show you spreadsheets saying otherwise. And a country like the UK that is so exposed to these COVID lockdowns and our economy, our hyper global, hyper service driven, hyper connected economy is really exposed. We should be kind of proud of that in one sense, but we should be mindful of it in the other. And so I think, unfortunately, and I don't say this lightly, I think the UK is uniquely exposed in this ugly baby competition going forward. Fraser, let's talk about that ugly baby competition around the world. Um, how are we comparing at the moment? Are we the ugliest? Uh, other countries also <laughs> shaking the magic money tree? Are any looking pretty? Let's give us There's a no ugly babies on this call, Katie. Come on. <laughs> well, 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 look around the world. Actually, you can see the shaking of the magic money tree is now an Olympic sport. I mean, the Brits are good at it, but others are also just as good. Uh, I mean, we might say, look at this, um, look at this basket case economy of ours. We've now got a massive deficit. It's um, it's something like um, I think it's eighteen percent of GDP of deficit right now. But that is, while huge and historic, and by the way, for Scotland, it's closer to twenty-five. Um, so, so good luck to an independent Scotland financing that in an open market. But in America, it's um, it's fifteen. In Japan, it's. 11% in Canada, it's 13% in Singapore, it's 14%. These massive deficits are being run up everywhere, absolutely everywhere right now. In fact, the only um, economy which is behaving itself is the Chinese one. Um, uh, they've got a deficit of closer to 4 or 5%, and they actually look like being one of the few economies in the world that will grow over the course of this year, having recovered so fast from the virus. So we ought to bear in mind that we're discussing here not a kind of a crazy theory cooked up by spendthrift people in number 10. This is the standard way in which large governments are borrowing. And governments with the central bank are using the central bank to print money. So yes, the Bank of England's printing money, but so is the ECB, so is it Japan, J Japan's national bank, so are the Swedish national bank. The same tactics, the same devices are being used everywhere and they are so far working. So we should put this in context. This isn't something of, this isn't Britain taking leave of its senses. This is Britain walking pretty much in lockstep with other major economies in the world right now. Now, the, obviously, I'm not sure if you look around the world, there actually is a country with a bigger uh, deficit to GDP ratio than Britain. I think our, our 18, 19% might be at the very top, but it's not so far away from, from other countries. So again, this normally I would be very critical of the government. My instinct is to say, look, you, you simply can't. I mean, of course, we know we have to do COVID spending. We know that. And I do get quite disconcerted when, um, when Matt Hancock does seem to say, for example, a few days ago, he was saying, of the care homes, don't worry, we've bought an iPad for every resident member of the care homes. Now that's, you know, okay, not the most expensive thing in the world, but it was like a gut reaction. Something's going wrong, let's spend lots of money. Let's continue with HS2, an incredibly expensive project, which is absolutely no chance of returning the capital in its investment. Um, I mean, increase in deficits, uh, uh, probably only about half of it is directly related to COVID. The rest will be other things that the government is just letting rip over this general time. So that's why I think Rishi Sunak will have a difficult path if he does intend to plot his way back to, to fiscal balance. 
Um, but right now, I have to say, but the markets, the world, the investments of the world are looking at like the stock market. The stock markets are not doing brilliantly right now. I mean, they, they, they've recovered to, you know, pretty much where they were um, pre-crash in America. They've been better in, in Britain, a little bit worse, but they're still looking relatively shaky. Um, investors still looking for security. That security still comes from lending to governments. And if you want to call that a magic money tree, then fair enough. But those governments can borrow at a negative rate of interest rate. It's not just Britain. This is something which you can do in countries right around the world right now. Now, I want to talk uh, before this uh, ends, ultimately, about how the Chancellor might plot some route back to eventually balancing the books, send a signal to the market so they don't get scooped and spooked. But before we get there, I just want to take a few audience questions and do send any more you have in on the chat function of this. Now, the first one we have here is, would the UK government have been able to borrow such staggering sums without quantitative easing? Kate? There's no doubt that in order to get through the COVID crisis, the Bank of England had to directly finance the Treasury. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds that it's needed to finance this so far. Um, and the Bank of England knew that. It's interesting to look at the BOE's response as soon as it was clear what was about to happen in the UK and that we were going to be going into this lockdown. Um, the Bank of England made it very clear that it would support the Treasury and it also slashed interest rates from a record low to an ultra record low. And there were reports that the Bank of England knew that if interest rates even crept up towards 1%, that the government would really struggle to finance its debt. Uh, again, it speaks to the shaky ground, but also the extent to which the government is absolutely relying on the Bank of England. When we talk about the magic money tree, we have to be very clear about where it is. I think it was you, Katie, who, who mentioned that it's in the Bank of England's backyard and that the governor has a lot of control right now. And I think that's why his interjection last week was so vitally important. And it came right before the job support scheme, which is estimated to only be about five billion pounds over the next six months. But it, it just indicates the fact that more firepower is probably being withheld um, and that a lot more money could be spent if the UK has more restrictions coming in. And frankly, it's hard to see how that doesn't happen because we seem to only be going in one direction, almost regardless of what the infection figures do, whether they're high one day or dipping the next. It, it seems we're only getting more restrictions. And you know, I mean, the government, um, in, unless it wanted to do something extremely painful when it comes to tax revenue or tax rises, which would be very harmful to the economy, which is on its knees right now. And we said the wrong signal to business. It, it, it's desperately relying on the Bank of England. Um, let's talk about that, Fraser, because the Bank of England governor last week su um, suggested that it was time for a further rethink, uh, making it, I would say unusual, but I think the current Bank of England governor has done a few of these things where it seems to defy convention slightly in terms of the relationship between the Bank of England and the Chancellor. So it made a public intervention suggesting there could be more furlough needed or targeted interventions. Do you think that was a, a sign that the bank is supportive of more QE? Are we reading too much into that? Or was that actually coordinated with the Treasury potentially? It's an interesting question. Um, right now, there is not that much love between the Bank of England governor and the Prime Minister. It's an open secret that Boris Johnson didn't want um, Griffith to be the, the, um, the Bank of England governor. He wanted Andy Haldane instead. The Sajid Javid, who was then Chancellor, made a big fuss about it, saying, look, I'm the Chancellor, I get to appoint it. And that was one of the rifts which led to Sajid Javid's eventual departure uh, from government. So we've got a Bank of England governor who knows that he's there in spite of the prime minister, not because of him. That, I don't know whether that makes him less inclined to be um, um, helpful to the government or not. Um, now, perhaps he is also thinking that not so much Rishi, Rishi Sunak, but the institutional treasury will right now be trying to win an argument with government saying, look, we can't go on spending like this. It's going to end in tears. We need to rein you in. And number 10 says, look, who, who's squealing right now? The markets aren't squealing. So perhaps the Bank of England is trying to let out your rod's helpful squeal. Um, a few months ago, there was actually, interestingly enough, Sajid Javid um, sort of did a podcast in his, um, one of his many post-Chancellor um, career uh, departures um, and where he interviewed the Bank of England governor and was told that the whole point of his quantitative easing 
fundraising is not to support the government. This isn't the Bank of England's job. The Bank of England's job is to sustain stability in the economy, not to write endless checks for, for number 10. Now, um, that was broadly taken to be a shot across the bows of number 10, thinking, look, don't think that you can just keep on spending like this because we'll turn off the taps eventually. But mind you, that was then. That was about 10 weeks ago. Um, now things have changed. It's getting ready to do. I mean, most city economists imagine there's going to be several tens of billions more of quantitative easing, easing that the Bank of England is going to do. Um, and now it's interesting that the Bank of England is also intervening in things like the furlough scheme, not really its direct responsibility, but it's chucking its oar in. The thing is, what we're not hearing is that is, is the Bank of England really saying louder, right, unfortunately, um, this has got to come to an end. The, the voice, the message that Boris Johnson will get is that, yes, it is there to give support for, for quite some time. And even in Britain's interest rates of about 0.2%, these are still a lot higher than those of France, Germany, Austria, Belgium, which are in negative uh, territory. So it doesn't, you don't have to look abroad. To, you, you basically have to look to, I don't know, Turkey, to South Africa, to Malaysia, to find a country which is in serious trouble with interest rates right now, because the rest of Europe certainly doesn't seem to be. What do you make of it, Liam, in terms of that relationship? Because Fraser mentions how that podcast interview was read in some quarters. I don't think it was universally welcomed in government, it's fair to say. But you also had Andrew Bailey speaking before, or due to speak for Tory MP MPs, a bit delayed, eventually happened. Do you think there's any reason to think the Bank of England isn't uh, prepared to print money for quite a long time to come? Is there any sign that could be kicked back? I think the general uh, trend uh, is that central banks around the world want to try and pass the buck back to politicians, to fiscal policy, because monetary policy is so stretched and at such ultra extreme levels. And there is, of course, tension between um, Number 10 and, and Threadneedle Street, as Fraser, as Fraser said. Andy Haldane was off, obviously a candidate, so was, you know, spec well known to the spectator, my co-author uh, on a book I wrote, Jerry Lyons, Boris's former chief economic advisor when he was mayor for London. Um, but again, Fraser's right in the sense that, you know, we are heading for serious unemployment in this country. When I was a kid, you know, UB40 was singing about one in 10. Um, um, we're looking, you know, the OBR even is estimating 13% unemployment uh, and that was before the latest lockdown measures and in that kind of environment then there will be an enormous pressure to keep looking to the Bank of England and there'll be enormous pressure on the Bank of England to keep delivering and this is why I guess I've been you know I've constantly put my head on the chopping block um, to say that we need to be mindful of what we're doing because there is going to be such pressure to just keep going on and on and on with this stuff. We're already spending 50 odd billion quid a year on debt service costs, and that's at ultra low interest rates. If you go from half a percent to 1%, that's a 100% increase in your borrowing costs right there. You know, soon a tiny incremental rise in market interest rates, and suddenly we're spending more on debt interest than we're spending on schools. I mean, that's a. <laughs> And when you have a, a sort of political dynamic where both major parties are in a kind of Dutch auction of who can outspend the other one, that's when markets start getting really concerned. That's when financial markets start reaching for tangible assets, um, uh, physical assets, or indeed for the dollar. Look, during the, the US presidential election, you know, you're going to have um, acolytes of modern monetary theory. Isn't it interesting that the kind of economic, the academic uh, fashionable theory uh, has the same initials as magic, magic money, money tree. We're going to be hearing a lot about, you know, professors like Stephanie Kelton, extremely articulate people who have, you know, good academic credentials who in recent years, she started out with Bernie Saunders, but have really been honing these arguments for the political marketplace in order to make them sound really credible. And those arguments will jump over the pond to here. I just cited a to former aide to Alex Salmon, senior SMB figure, basically talking complete nonsense um, about economics. And when you have 
the Labour Party saying to the Tory party, which they will, oh, well, you did QE to bail out the bankers. Why can't you do QE just to keep spending more and more and more and more money? So when even the more prudent side of politics here and then the US uh, gets, you know, engages on this kind of turf, when the language becomes so extreme, when there doesn't seem to be a grown up in the room anymore, that's why when financial markets will get deeply concerned and there will be a flight to quality. And I'm afraid, again, I say this with regret, in that flight to quality, the dollar will benefit and tangible assets will benefit, um, you know, land will benefit, but sterling will not benefit. Um, and when you have a, a real run on a currency, that's when you get a spike in inflation and interest rates go up, whatever the Bank of England says or does. Um, and that's when you get real, you know, that really stymies investment and it's the poor that suffer most during this. So I don't really see anything within our sort of political culture at the moment, within our kind of economic debate to stop us getting to a situation where there is just a complete free for all, where the only reason you're not spending money uh, is because you're a bad person. Um, and when the political get, debate gets to that level, which is where we're headed and we're going to see it in the States and it will come here, then that's, you know, that's when, you know, history starts repeating itself and you're sparking crises. Now we have a question from Gina saying, have any of the political parties found a better money tree? Are there alternatives? Fraser, let's go to you first on this because you were probably speaking the most positively of QE. And I think that, I wonder whether it's made you rethink Corbynism, for example. It does sometimes feel as though we are, if we're going back to the various manifestos we've seen, we're mirroring one a little bit more these days, even if, even if it is down to a pandemic. Well, first of all, I wouldn't say I was speaking positively about QE. Uh, I, 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 my position is that the arguments against it that I used 10 years ago um, and that we hear a lot from Liam now are a lot harder to make in the absence of any sort of um, that hard evidence. Sure, uh, I mean, Liam can talk to, the, to, to asset price inflation. We do know that QE does push up assets. Um, one of the things that when the latest badge of QE came along, I thought to myself, well, that will be come through pretty quickly onto house prices and just to shop stock prices as it did last time around. That is needless to say that exacerbates inequality. It makes um, the whole economy rigged against those with assets. It's a deeply unfair system whose side effects are absolutely not properly discussed. What it doesn't do though is end, or what it hasn't done so far, is end to massive consumer price inflation, is ended to a massive of increase in debt interest and the kind of a reckoning which you've had throughout most of our, uh, our, our economic um, history. I have to say though that when I look back on, um, uh, on Corbynism and the attacks being used against Corbynism, magic money tree, let's not forget, was a Theresa May phrase used to describe the economics of the Labour Party. I now remember that you know, this was a great battle that Sajid Javid and Boris Johnson had during the campaign. There was, Sajid Javid was saying, look, we have got to be the party of fiscal responsibility. We need to attack Labour as a spendthrift party. We need to say to them, these guys will spend, 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 and you know in your heart there will be a price to pay, dear voter. Because it does stand to reason it is common sense. But as soon as they won that election, the Tories tore up. They have formally abandoned the, um, the balance your budget pledge, which was in the last Tory manifesto. Once they did that, it became a lot harder to say what was the big difference between, um, between Labour and the Tories. If Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell were in power right now, would they be borrowing just as much as the British Britain is now? And remember, given that our deficit is right now almost literally the biggest in the whole wide world, it's hard to think that a Labour government would be borrowing that much more. So I do actually think that there ought to be a mini kind of apology tour of Conservatives to Labour economics teams under Corbyn to the effect of saying, look, we said there wasn't a magic money tree. We've actually found out that there is and we intend to use it for the foreseeable future. 
we'll take that as the beginning. Um, Liam, if we're looking oh, at the front page. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a scoop. Yeah. Uh, Liam, if we're looking at the political parties, so if they've got better money trees, um, do you think there is any, do you look around and see anywhere any other party doing it better. Labour don't say, tend to say too much actually on the economy at the moment, ever since they came up with a wealth tax and then seemed to fight about mm. it for a while. Um, but is it is it more that the Conservatives have taken other parties' money trees and people have alternatives? I think the battle will become, I mean, if, if, if it does just become, um, you know, who's got the biggest printing press, um, um, then the battle will become, and, and, and Kate put her finger on it, um, how you actually spend the money. The only kind of modicum of sort of respectability about your financial position will then be, ah, and you can already hear it in the political debate, but we're spending our money, we're spending the money on things that are productive, so it'll actually boost the supply side. And even I would, and even I would um, put some store by that argument. You know, I've, I've, in, in, in my latest book, Home Truths, I wrote that the government should borrow in order to build social housing. Um, and then you can use resource accounting to put those new social homes on the government's balance sheet, uh, rather than spending 25 billion pounds a year on, on housing benefit to house vulnerable families, lower income families who need social housing uh, with private landlords, often substandard unsafe homes not always but 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 disproportionately so you know clearly we are entering a, a period in our economic history where everybody has to be pretty intellectually agile with their with their views and that's only right that's that's the national debate that's that that's democracy but there is a danger i would say sort of pulling the telescope back and looking at the big picture there is a danger when you've got you know, even very fiscally prudent instinctively uh prudent political parties, political parties that have, you know, their brand is, um, you know, solid housekeeping and, and, and grown up economics, uh, like the Conservative Party. Um, I mean, you know, there was quite a lot of um, polling evidence, even during the real tough years of sort, sort of austerity that we had, where Osborne on Cameron, and you can never take this away from them, they did get their spending under control to a degree, even though there was an awful lot of borrowing going on on the other side of the balance sheet. There were lots of polls showing that was actually quite a popular policy. Of course, you had interest groups who were rightly screaming about lack of money at local government and lack of money for the justice system. And at the sharp end, you know, so some social policies were curtailed and there was genuine human suffering, of course. But actually, that was broadly popular from a political point of view. So, I mean, I think if we look back in sort of 10 years time on the situation we're in now and, you know, we hear um, all political parties agreeing that, yeah, it's different this time. You know, who, who needs to read the history of the Roman Empire or the history of the Weimar Republic or, you know, the history of mankind, frankly, because it happens every every hundred years or so. Um, we suddenly believe we've got a better system and we can just basically spend as much as we want. And, and then there's a collapse because of that in which ordinary people suffer most. And none of the people advocating these policies at the sharp end is going to suffer, of course, because you know, they'll, they'll be they'll be well, well healed. Then you could really have a, a crisis, actually, of, uh, of 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 consent for capitalism. You could have a crisis of consent for the clever people who are meant to be looking after us. And they've caused like three mega financial crises in you know, 10, 15 or 20 years. And so I think an awful lot of, is at stake here. If we just carry on doing this, uh, the logical conclusion is that we're going to end up in a really big mess. Uh, and it will, won't just be a one-off financial collapse. When you've had a, a big financial collapse so soon after an earlier financial collapse, so soon after the dot-com collapse, you know, then suddenly the, 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 our time on earth as, as adults and opinion formers starts to look pretty bad. And there will be a political backlash from that uh, and it won't be pretty and broadly liberal minded people like all of us on this call who disagree about most things but agree fundamentally about you know, representative democracy and all the rest of it. You can have a, a lot more extreme politics if we end up going down a financial cul-de-sac because of this policy. Um, 
Now, I just want, we've only got about 10 minutes left. So if you have any last minute questions, do send them in. But otherwise, I want to touch on a few that we've got in, which is almost how does Rishi Sunak get us out of this? So I wondered in terms of closing remarks, it'd be good to hear from each of you what you think. You know, if you were the Chancellor, if you're looking at the fact, and everyone here has agreed that whether or not this position is sustainable, as Chancellor, you have to be responsible and presume it's not. What do you think the step is to getting to a place where not balancing the books perhaps, but on the, at least on the path to it? Because with all the restrictions, with the habits we've got into, it can seem quite hard to find that, particularly when there seems to be a general consensus at the moment, which as Fraser, you were touching on, we would almost be the, the outlier of if, if we broke it. And um, who would like to go first? I would um, say that the step that Rishi Sunak needs to take if he wants to do that, is a step next door into number 10. Because right now, um, under Boris Johnson, he, the Prime Minister is, you know, he once described his political philosophy as being, uh, as cakeism, pro having cake, pro eating it. Now, that is what you do with deficits. You decide, you know, it, when faced with a choice of spending as much as a continental European country or taxing as little as Britain has historically, you want to do both, thinking that the magic money tree will come in the middle. And his political career has tended to be defined by the rejection of choices which lesser mortals have, have had to make. And, and I think it will take quite a lot to persuade him. I mean, he, by the way, he's already ruled out, um, going back to what we used to call austerity. He ruled that out in one of his speeches. In addition, by the way, to ruling out um, VAT tax increases to or income tax increases. His manifesto basically um, rules out raising taxes. He's ruled out spending less. Uh, so the only thing in the middle of that is a magic money tree. Now, once those major decisions have been taken by the prime minister, the job of a chancellor really is to keep on finding the money. Um, I suspect that Rishi Sunak would quite like it if the Conservatives were talking about the need to balance the budget a bit more, if it were a discussion held by a few more voices than the ones around this, this panel today. The problem is that the Tories who used to be so uh, the most keen on balancing budgets are now mad keen for Brexit. And they don't mind a a lo quite a lot of borrowing because it's more important to them that the, the bill is written to get the Brexit transition done. So the John Redwoods of this world are basically not back in formation in the same way that they were under David Cameron to get the balanced budget. And therefore, Boris doesn't really face the political pressure or the economic pressure to, to stop shaking that tree. Liam, what do you think? Is there a way to get on, you know, path of the straight and narrow without uh, losing Boris Johnson as prime minister? <laughs> I agree with, I agree with uh, the phrase that a lot of the more hawkish people, their eyes are elsewhere uh, at, at the moment. Um, I mean, I, I'd stress that, you know, if you look back to 2009, the UK was disproportionately impacted because it was a global banking crisis and we got a lot of banks, <laughs> a big financial services industry. And we're similarly disproportionately impacted by this pandemic because, as I said at the opening, we're a service-driven economy, an outward-looking, hyper-globalised um, economy. I do think it is going to be difficult for uh, uh, Rishi uh, Sunak. He is a very financially sophisticated person, and I'm sure you know he has a, the same kind of concerns about fiscal realism that Sajid Javid has. You know, they're from similar backgrounds before politics. They were, you know, genuinely involved in financial markets at, at a high level and once you've done had that kind of experience um it never really it never really uh, leaves you i think we are going to see though uh, a, a continuation of, we're going to sort of suck and see aren't we over the next six months and hope that we can manage to grow our way out of this crisis um uh, what i'd really like to see from the chancellor and i Gave him a little bit of a hard time in, in my column at the weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he was concerned about that. Um, I'd like to see much more of a, of a vision thing. And this isn't just soaring rhetoric. Look, investors, real world investors, not financial market investors, but real world investors, they're sitting on a lot of cash uh, because they're really spooked by what the political and media class basically is saying and doing about with monetary policy. And they think financial markets are 
over bloated both bond and stock markets and they're, and they're right to convince people business owners business leaders to put their money on to work again to build that extra production to build those factories to re-employ people after covid you need to you know Keynes taught, taught us about animal spirits you need to stir the natural entrepreneurialism of this country which we have in spades and is always i think our trump card in getting our our kind of skewed over financialized economy out of the hole again and again the generation after generation and i was actually a little bit disappointed that there wasn't more of the vision thing. We've had very little about the vision thing in economics from the prime minister and similarly from the chancellor. And this kind of speech making and steering and leading is really, really important to signal to investors, real world investors, uh, where we're going, to give them a kind of story, a narrative that they can cling on to. Um, and I actually think it was a tactical error for the chancellor to rule out having a budget now, some people would say, oh, we, there's enough uncertainty. And other people are saying, oh, we don't need a budget because that would have implications on our Brexit negotiations and all the rest of it. But look, we just borrowed £35 billion in one month, right? We've borrowed £175 billion since March. We need to, to declare and, and, and attempt to explain, even in a situation of enormous uncertainty, everyone knows there's huge uncertainty, but you need to at least have the difficult discussions within government and between departments about how we can get out of this, even under the current circumstances and assuming the current circumstances either get better, stay the same or get worse in terms of lockdown. Uh, and of course, our lockdown policy will be key to all of this. The fact that he delayed the budget, to me, it looked a bit like when a PLC delays an audit, right? It always goes wrong. It always leads to a reduction in the share price. It's always because there's issues you don't want to face. There's realities that you can't stomach. And I think to delay a budget, it risks signaling to the markets that the Chancellor and the Prime Minister can't handle having these really, really difficult discussions about fiscal policy. And that is a concern to me, because once you stop having those discussions, and the big players in government put their heads down a hole like ostriches, that's when markets start getting concerned. So I, I hope it isn't, uh, but I hope we aren't looking back in, in six months thinking that delaying that budget, ruling out a budget, or even a serious fiscal update uh, this autumn, uh, I hope we, that doesn't turn out to be a big error. Thanks, Liam. And Kate, you get the final word. What is the best path out of this? Look, I don't envy the Chancellor either. Uh, as Fraser's already touched upon, you can cut spending, go for austerity, uh, but based on the reportings that you've done, Katie, on the internal workings of the Conservative Party, they don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. The fact that they're pressing on with HS2 would suggest they really have no plans to cut spending. I don't think your average member of the public, public would think that scrapping that in very unpopular project would count as the traditional interpretation of austerity, uh, but there we go. Um, the chancellor can raise taxes, uh, arguably another form of austerity, uh, but he can raise taxes, but um, that has significant political costs, potentially breaking manifesto promises. As well, they're in a very tricky position. You can't go around looking at who did well in the age of coronavirus, the businesses in particular that got us through, that adapted, that kept us fed and entertain sitting at home and say, well done, now we're going to tax you. So if you look at those who might have a bit more money circulating around and in their back pocket, it's not obvious you want to take it and then create a, you know, a, a sense that if you do well in the age of COVID, you're then going to be taxed on it. But I, I would add, and Liam touched upon this a, a third way, and that is going for economic growth. I think if I were the chancellor, one of the things that would deeply concern me are all of these comparisons to World War II. One of the reasons the economy jumped back so quickly and we were able to get spending under control is because economic growth was very good. Now, obviously this year we're looking at a, a huge contraction. We had a 20% contraction in the second quarter. Uh, the economy is, has, has fallen drastically this year, but let's look at the past decade. Growth was on average roughly 1.8%, I believe. It has not been a pro-growth decade. So 
if the chancellor wants to grow his way out of this public spending problem, uh, he's going to have to go for a lot of supply side reforms, some of which are going to be politically difficult. It's great to see that they're already tackling the planning system. Uh, that should hopefully give Britain a, a real boost when that gets underway, but they're going to have to do more. I suppose I would just end by going back to a question that, that you asked earlier, Katie, about um, Corbynism and, and does this justify it, I suppose, in a way. I still think there are major differences. It, you won't find an economist, you'll struggle to anyway, on the left or the right who would argue that during a pandemic, when you have to hibernate the economy, that is not the time to spend money. Virtually everybody agrees that is the time to spend a lot of money. I think the difference is that, well, both parties in the 2019 election were, were looking at spending more than, than was within their means. The Conservatives were going to overspend by tens of billions, and the Labour Party was going to overspend in supposedly the good times by hundreds of billions of pounds. Uh, no, no plan to, to get their house in order in the good times. So I think the real criticism of the Conservative Party is where has that fundamental philosophy gone that you have to make sure that the books are in order when, when times are good, because when times get bad, when you have a pandemic or something else horrible uh, that happens, that's when you need to spend the money. Uh, and again, if I were the chancellor, I would be thinking about uh, this new pledge to free school meals over the summer. We're, we're told that's a COVID policy, but I suspect that won't go away next year. The government's gonna have to fund that in day-to-day -day spending. Quite a lot of measures that have come in in the name of COVID, I think will last. And the chancellor is going to have to be very strict unless he wants to fall into some kind of Corbynist thinking, uh, that that money really has to be accounted for. That that day-to-day -day spending and theoretically the better times, it's hard to think of a good time at the moment in the future, but better times uh, can be funded by the magic money tree. Brilliant, thanks Kate. And probably to leave people on a slightly uh, adding to the pessimism perhaps, uh, interesting you mentioned planning reforms and supply side because speaking to Tory MPs today, I think that in itself is going to be a battle to even mm. get through. So um, very interesting times ahead and I'm sure we'll be having more discussions like this in the coming months. Um, thank you to Kate, thank you to Liam, thank you to Fraser for joining us today and thank you for watching. Do join us tomorrow for the final day of the alternative conference, Time Flies When You're Having Fun. Um, thanks a lot. I'm now going to exit this conversation and end the chat.